Orleans is a place like nowhere else. A place so dominated by water, it's almost an island. But here, the average resident lives six feet below sea level. In a city where anything goes, we'll discover the best of a paradise of excess. From a club hop that keeps you jumping, to places where the party never ends. We'll seek out the mysteries of voodoo and the rhythms of the street. We'll meet people who savor a sunset and all the best things in life. Meandering with the curves of the muddy Mississippi, it's so easy to lose yourself and your sense of direction, so we'll follow the locals. Riverside, Lakeside, Uptown, and Downtown. In search of the best of the Big Easy. New Orleans is the Big Easy. Here, intense rains, followed by steamy days, set the stage for decadence and permanent good times. The wild culture and love of all the best things in life is contagious. In the next hour, we'll take you on the ultimate guide to one extraordinary place. We'll begin in the heart of New Orleans, the French Quarter. 90 square blocks where locals intermingle with tourists and everything is the real thing. It's here that you can catch the Big Easy's best sunrise when you start your day overlooking the Mississippi River across from Jackson Square. Here, the city was founded some 300 years ago. The morning light illuminates St. Louis Cathedral at the base of Jackson Square. In the center of the square, a former militia training field honors hero Andrew Jackson, the man who defended the city from British troops in the Battle of New Orleans. On the edge of Jackson Square, Café du Monde can be your last stop at night or your first stop in the morning. The 150-year-old landmark makes up the best local pastry, the beignet, 24 hours a day. This French pillow-shaped version of the donut is turned out assembly style, piping hot and smothered in powdered sugar. It's served along with Café du Monde's own blend of chicory coffee 364 days a year. Café du Monde closes only for Christmas Day and the occasional hurricane. If you crave something more than beignets and chicory coffee, then head on over to Brennan's for the best breakfast in town and possibly the best breakfast in America. Owner Clark Brennan, whose grandfather made breakfast at the House of Brennan world famous, tells us how it all began. My grandfather, Owen Brennan Sr., uh, started Brennan's in 1946. There was competition in, at a dinner house and you had Arno's, you had Antoine's, Galatoire's, and some of the old line restaurants. And at the time, uh, the book called Dinner at Antoine's had come out, and it was a very popular book around the country. And my, father, my grandfather felt like, well, if they can do dinner at Antoine's, I need to do something different. Why can't I do breakfast at Brennan's? If you're looking for fast food, don't stop here. The average Brennan's breakfast lasts two leisurely hours combining breakfast, brunch, and lunch in the old Creole style. When you talk about breakfast, you have to be talking about Brennan's. There's nobody can do it better than we can. Because it's not just a breakfast per se. It's unique dishes like the egg Shannon with his saute spinach, saute fish, poached eggs on the top with a hollandaise sauce. You have the classic uh, egg sardou, which is Holland Russ, Canadian bacon, Marchana Van, poached eggs, the hollandaise sauce. A typical multi-course breakfast at Brennan's ends with Bananas Foster, one of New Orleans' most popular dishes since it was invented in 1951. It's in the dictionary that it was created by Brennan's. And it's a dish that's very simple. It's a combination of butter, brown sugar, cinnamon, banana liqueur, bananas, and you flambe it with rum. But the, the best part about it, you put it over a good old-fashioned ice cream, vanilla ice cream, and that's the banana faucet. Believe it or not, 35,000 pounds of bananas are flambéed at Brennan's each year to keep up with the demand for their signature dish. We move on to the best places to stay. Four French Quarter hotels do something better than anyone else to make the list. 
The Royal Sinesta's location, right in the heart of the party, makes it a perfect choice. The hotel stands in courtly contrast to the craziness on Bourbon Street. The lobby is an elegant oasis where you can get away from it all. And the second floor balcony offers a romantic view where wall-to-wall -wall people watching never ends. Maison de Ville, one of the best small hotels in the world, was playwright Tennessee Williams' regular choice for a place to stay. He lived and wrote in room number nine. What really distinguishes this hotel is the lush courtyard. It's one of the many private courtyards hidden behind unassuming buildings throughout the quarter. But here you can experience firsthand a touch of paradise set in another place and time. Another best place to stay is a hotel built on the site of the first posh hotel in America, the Exchange Hotel, which was destroyed by the hurricane of 1915. But the Omni Royal Orleans does it justice. From an opulent lobby, there's a window to the middle of the French Quarter, and the rooftop has the best panoramic view of the neighborhood. Finally, in a city where record high humidity causes things to look old the moment they're built, and faded elegance is the norm, the Ritz-Carlton is very much an exception to the rule. The former Maison Blanche department store has been transformed into an impeccable four-star hotel that is a world apart but located right on the edge of the quarter. New Orleans is called the city that care forgot because there are no rules. Many of the 1,300 bars close only for a couple of hours a day. And it's no surprise that the Hurricane is the Big Easy's best cocktail. And just about every bar in town has their own take on it. Pat O'Brien serves up the best Hurricane of them all. The drink was invented here when grain rationing caused a shortage of whiskey during World War II. Pat O'Brien's had a lot of people they wanted to drink. There wasn't a lot of whiskey, so they took rum, which was plentiful, and some fruit juices and put it together in a glass shaped like the hurricane lamp glass, and that's how the hurricane came to be. But nowadays, the hurricane is everywhere in New Orleans, and people make it with rum, vodka, triple sec, even liqueurs like Southern Comfort and Amaretto can be used in them. As for the hurricane, the storm, Hurricane season runs from June to November with an annual average of 58 inches of rain, and every inch of it has to be pumped out. Living below sea level is an odd phenomenon, but here it's business as usual, thanks to the Big Easy's best engineering marvel. New Orleans pumping station number six has a capacity to pump up to 25 billion gallons a day. It's one of a system of stations that keeps the Big Easy's head above water, according to Sewage and Water Board Superintendent Joe Sullivan. If you pull the plug on the pumping station, uh, I, would, I would estimate that within two days you'd have water in all the sea level and below streets, and I guess probably another week or so you'd probably have water up to where halfway up the French Quarter. It'll just start rising. How long would it rise? It would rise until it reached the river level. This pumping station right now is ready for a hurricane if, it's, if one could come flying through. Uh, we, do, we never leave anything undone. Along with all the rain comes a craving for comfort food. The best gumbo. 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 Chicken and dewy gumbo. I love gumbo. I like seafood gumbo. In the Creole, we call it gumbo yaya. We're known for our gumbo. So the main ingredient of gumbo is our roux. The roux. You got it's the roux. Everybody knows it's the roux. Uh, and, and it's basically oil and flour cooked to the color of chocolate. And it's not for, it's not for thickening. It actually, it does give it a little bit of consistency, but it's for the taste. You can make gumbo pretty much out of anything. The secret is in the head of the shrimp. You have to boil the shrimp heads. You have to taste it to really believe it. In a port town with a mix of nationalities, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Irish, Haitian, African, all coming together like a gumbo, the subject of the best gumbo can provoke some heat. It's a tough call, but what you can't beat is the combination of the gumbo and the atmosphere at the Napoleon House. This restaurant and bar was actually built as a refuge for the French Emperor Napoleon complete with a turret to look out for the British. Here, the right spice meets the right spot. Many places in the quarter take you back in time. 
Lafitte's blacksmith shop feels as old as the hills because it really is. It's speculated that liquor has been continually served at this worn Creole cottage longer than in any bar in America. In fact, it's the best dive in town. Rumor has it that Lafitte's was never really a blacksmith shop at all, but a front for the notorious pirates Jean and Pierre Lafitte smuggling operation in the 1700s. The well, fascinating thing about Lafitte's is uh, in the room itself, in the evening, there is no electric lighting. It's all lit by candles and uh, people will often ask me, you know, what's a cool bar for this or a cool bar for that? And I'll say, well, Lafitte's is a great bar to go to on a blind date because it's very, very dark. In addition to plenty of atmosphere, Lafitte's offers one old-fashioned romantic service outside. Cocktails are brought to horse-drawn carriages as they pull up curbside. Thanks. You're welcome. A toast. Hey, in New there's in New Orleans. In the Big Easy, people eat a lot, people drink a lot, and people stay out late. They call New Orleans the city that care for God simply because uh, people here just, uh, when they arrive, they, they, they go into another mindset. The best party street maybe in the world is Bourbon Street, without, without a doubt, you know. Bourbon Street, named for the French Duke, not the whiskey, sets the standard for life that moves from day right into night. Here, rock and bluegrass meets drag queens, meets jazz, and a host of the outrageous and outgoing. Music streams out from doorways along the balcony line street. If you really want to laisser le bon temps brûlé or let the good times roll, being a voyeur isn't good enough. Go with the flow from bar to bar until you just can't take it anymore. The French Quarter was founded along the crescent-shaped curve of the Mississippi River some 300 or so years ago giving New Orleans another nickname, Crescent City. We've discovered the quarter is still the best place to be at sunrise and the best place to party all night. We'll now venture outside the quarter to neighborhoods built on the high ground of Canal Banks and Back to follow the music, a soundtrack that plays 24 seven on the streets and in the clubs. The best of the best, Louis Armstrong, is gone, but his legacy is very much alive in the city that brought us the first American art form, jazz. On any given night, you could probably go to over 20 music venues and find live, good music. You know, I have a show tonight, but if I didn't have a show and we got in the car, say, and went to those 20 music clubs, I could come in with my trumpet and just go sit in. And then there's the classic tunes that really closely associated with New Orleans, like um, Basin Street Blues and Used to Miss New Orleans. And I, I do all those songs every night. I love them. Basin Street, that's the street where all the people like to meet. Way down in New Orleans, the land of dreams. You never know how nice it seems. Just how much it really means. Basin Street in the Treme District is part of the best local story of one of the most infamous red light districts in America, Storyville. Basin Street was the main artery of Storyville, the district thought to be the birthplace of jazz. But the Storyville era was just one part of the bigger picture of the evolution of jazz. Scores of musicians, including the great Jelly Roll Morton, got their start playing the Basin Street bordellos and jazz once thrived right here alongside the world's oldest profession. Things had gotten just so bad in, in the city of New Orleans, uh, we actually had procurers on the streets soliciting young, young people to go into this profession. I'm talking about children. Uh, we had a house of ill repute in almost every square of ground in the city of New Orleans. Had a very righteous man, his name was Sidney Story. He was an elderman of the city, a very, very religious man and a very wealthy man. And he went all over the world finding out what it is that they do to sort of control it. He came back, he said, well, what they do is they use a red light district, meaning red light is danger. Local historian Buddy Stahl says that this legendary red light district was the brainchild of one very upstanding citizen. So in 1897, they took off 39 square blocks and named it, of course, after who? The most righteous man in the city of New Orleans, his name was Sidney Story. Storyville's legal status permitted the publishing of the notorious Blue Book. 
the guide to the best of the bordellos that included Madame Josie Arlington's Pleasure Palace and Lulu White's Mahogany Hall and many more names and numbers. Storyville came to an end, by the way, uh, 1917, and it came about because of World War I. <laughs> the United States Navy came around and they said, look, we will not have any houses of ill repute within five miles of a military base. New Orleans is surrounded by the military. So therefore, uh, November the 17th, 1917, the United States Navy put an end to it. The stone mansions were torn down long ago to make way for a housing project. Only one story of the building that housed the Blue Book Press still stands, along with another old bordello building around the corner. And that's all that's left of an entire district that employed 2,000 working girls in 230 houses in 1899. If even a small part of the Storyville neighborhood had been preserved, what a tourist attraction it would be today. Although Storyville is gone, what has endured is the city's passion for music played on the streets and in the clubs. From Dixieland brass bands to Zydeco to rhythm and blues, there's an amazing amount of live music to choose from nightly. The Big Easy's best club hop samples the music that keeps things jumping. Beginning uptown at the Maple Leaf, the Rebirth Brass Band's showdown has a sold out crowd on their feet. The Rebirth Band takes traditional New Orleans brass in a whole new direction with their own mix of brass, pop, funk, and raw energy. The place is down and dirty, the humidity is high, and everybody moves with the funk. Then it's on to the heart of Mid-City, where the Rockin' Bowl, a strip mall bowling alley turned dance club, takes you back to the year 1958. Thursday night is Zydeco night, beginning with dance lessons guaranteed to get you out on the floor. Zydeco music originated outside New Orleans in the Bayou country, but in the big city, musicians like Zydeco Force infuse their music with enough hip hop to get a new generation moving to the beat of the accordion, the principal instrument of Zydeco music. The lanes rock, the house is packed, and this club is as authentic as it gets. And the best club hop back in the quarter with jazz at the Ritz Carlton's ultra sophisticated French Quarter Bar, where jazz trumpeter and crooner Jeremy Davenport performs regularly. Jeremy's career included stints with jazz greats Wynton Marcellus and Harry Connick Jr. before forming his own band. His signature blend of brass and smooth vocals makes old standards resonate with a cutting edge crowd. Music continues on into the wee hours, but before, during, or after any club hopping, you can drop by Harris Spectacular Casino open around the clock. In a city with a long history of being hooked on gambling, it's fitting that the best bet is a casino. Harris is huge. With 100,000 square feet of gaming, it looks like it sits on an island, but it's the only land-based casino and the only legal place to gamble in town. Here, Mardi Gras magic happens all year long. Theme decorations created by famous float makers keep up the carnival atmosphere. According to Harris, 17,000 people a day try to beat the odds on 2,400 slot machines that include all the latest real video games. 120 gaming tables run through 241,000 decks of cards in a year. Harris pays out an average of 50,000 jackpots per month, making it a definite best bet. From club hops that keep the party moving to gambling from dusk until dawn, people in the Big Easy live life to the fullest. They also learn to live among the dead. 
Here, even a funeral is an excuse for a parade. The New Orleans above ground cities of the dead are a constant reminder of the mysterious inevitable. Burials below sea level sometimes resulted in bodies resurfacing, and that, combined with French custom, led to burying the dead above ground. Bodies were placed inside the tombs, sealed for at least a year and a day to ensure complete decomposition. The bones were then swept to the back of the tomb when the families needed to make room for another person. But the best way to go, bar none, is found at the Lake Lawn Metairie Cemetery, a landmark located where families could acquire enough property to build some of the most spectacular send-offs in America. Here, a white marble sarcophagus inspired by a memorial to an Italian cardinal in Florence cost $60,000 to construct in 1918. Other tombs pay homage to the Civil War. A Confederate soldier calls the role of the honored dead. And a ruined castle, a replica of the family's chapel in Ireland, is intentionally built to look damaged as a tribute to the two sons killed in battle. In another part of the cemetery, a faithful dog sheds a perpetual tear for his master. And the Moriarty tomb, at a majestic 60 feet, carries out the owner's wish to build a monument to his wife that would dwarf all others. Bordering Basin Street, St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 is the oldest cemetery in New Orleans. It's thought to bear the remains of the best local legend, Marie Laveau, a hairdresser and devout Catholic who became the most prominent voodoo figure in America sometime around 1830. Though none of the writings about her can be cited as fact, neither can her exact burial spot. Today, fact and fiction blend right in, and followers continue to seek Marie Laveau's help from the grave. Many believe her energy and healing power are there, retained in her bones, similar to the relics of a saint. Open the gates, Papa Laveau, open the way. An estimated 15 to 25 percent of the population practices some level of voodoo. Priestess Ava K. Jones says the voodoo religion is part of the fabric of the city. There is a whole nother side to our New Orleans culture. You see, we have many influences, the African and the Caribbean influence in our New Orleans culture. And um, what people term voodoo today was actually handed down through our family lines. So even though we went to church as children, um, we grew up seeing our elders and our grandmothers do things to protect themselves from harm, to attract good fortune, to protect themselves against mischievous neighbors. And so it's just get as much in our culture as our Christian faith. I bless your heart. Commonly, people associate voodoo's ancient hand. secrets and herbal God cures with potions, gris gris, charms, and dolls that are used to influence matters of health, love, luck, and fortune. For the wisdom to walk in the path of your greatest good. Amen, amen, and amen. Ashe, ashe, and ashe. But that's not all there is to it. In voodoo, intention is everything. In voodoo, we worship uh, God and the spirits by means of drumming, songs, dance. The snake, or serpent, represents wisdom and figures into the voodoo creation mythology. We do the snake dance in honor not only of the voodoo serpent god, Dambala, who is not representing evil of any sort, but we also do it in honor of Marie Laveau, the great voodoo queen. Dambala, Dambala, Sayalo, Kusea. The voodoo religion has been passed down through family lines since it was first introduced here in the early 1700s. New Orleans voodoo is as unique as the city itself. There was a time when pharmacists made voodoo grigri and love potions known only by number. The best of the old time remedies can be found at the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. 
Louis Dufio, the first licensed pharmacist in the United States, opened this apothecary shop in 1823. At that time, your pharmacist was your local chemist. You came here for everything, from cosmetics to perfumes to medications. Pharmacists grew echinacea and other medicinal herbs and worked with local voodoo and Native American healers to create cures. According to Elizabeth Good, curator of the Pharmacy Museum, in the 1800s, the voodoo priestess's remedy for syphilis offered more hope than the conventional cure. Mercury was one of the most commonly dispensed medications in the 1800s, which was obviously toxic and poisonous and uh, would just sort of further along your eventual death. If you went to see a voodoo priestess, she would most likely prescribe moldy bread, which is essentially penicillin, and you might have a better, better chance of survival. Displayed at the pharmacy museum is another old-time remedy. Bleeding with leeches was once a common treatment to remove unhealthy blood thought to cause a variety of illnesses. The notorious aphrodisiac Spanish fly would have been prescribed for blistering. A tonsil guillotine was used to remove your tonsils, and there was one last resort surgical procedure, a trephination drill. If you were crazy, uh, they thought that you had evil spirits or perhaps you suffered from severe migraine headaches. So they would remove a small piece of the skull to release these spirits. But the very best old time remedy has to be the soda fountain. Invented in the 1830s as a means to dispense bitter tasting medicines with flavorings. The first soft drinks were concocted to help medicine go down and the Sazerac, the first cocktail, was invented by a French Quarter pharmacist. But there isn't a remedy that can cure deja vu, one of the Big Easy's most common and unsettling phenomena. You walk down a street in New Orleans and suddenly you feel like you've been there before. People in New Orleans seem to experience this that more often than anywhere else in the country. And I think it's because the people who are here are experiencing that phenomenon of having been in a place that has a 300-year-old history. And you believe that you've been there once or, or maybe twice. There are people who live in New Orleans who actually believe they've lived here two or three lifetimes, one in each century. Jackson Square, where the city began, is the best place to experience deja vu. And not surprisingly, one of the city's signature photo ops. Stroll through Pirate's Alley, or along the columns of the Presbyter. From one of the benches that line the park, imagine life in the 17, 18, or 1900s. Flanking each side of Jackson Square are the Pantalba apartments with their elaborate cast iron balconies. The Greek Revival apartment buildings were built in the 1850s by the Baroness Pantalba with a vision of creating an exclusive neighborhood influenced by the grand boulevards of Paris. Like everything in Jackson Square, it just triggers the imagination. In the Big Easy, anywhere you go, uptown, downtown, lakeside or riverside, the passion for food rivals the passion for music. The sheer number of exceptional restaurants make planning your next meal serious business. The local cuisine has two major influences, Creole and Cajun and both are bests. The Cajuns came from Nova Scotia and brought with them a hearty, spicy country-style cooking. The more sophisticated Creole cuisine, with its variety of rich sauces, evolved from traditional French fare. The old line French Creole establishments that began with the opening of Antoine's in 1840 continue a tradition of world-class cuisine in beautiful settings. Another landmark, Commander's Palace, nestled in the middle of the Garden District, has the best of everything, Creole, American, and their own innovative cuisine. The restaurant still enforces what, in the Big Easy, is a strict dress code. No shorts are permitted. A meal there is a special occasion, like being a guest at a garden party. Cajun and Creole cuisine evolved as a variety of ethnic cooks added their own spices to the mix. K. Paul's chef, Paul Miller, feels that today, the lines between the different influences blur. We're not Italian, we're not French, we're not Cajun, we're just, we're Louisiana, which means a lot of ethnic groups have lived here in Louisiana, and so there's a lot of influences. In a food-loving culture, culinary horizons continue to expand. At Bayona, 
Master Chef Susan Spicer reigns over the best new global cuisine. I feel really privileged to have gotten involved in cooking and food um, in a time of incredible growth and excitement in the United States. And we've just seen such an explosion of interest and availability of product and education and excitement and uh, it's been a fabulous time. Another food item synonymous with New Orleans is the city's best sandwich, the muffaletta. A combination of Italian bread, meats and cheeses piled high on a sandwich dripping with spicy olive salad. The best muffaletta is the original one that locals swear by. Go to uh, Central Grocery, get a wonderful muffaletta, and go down and sit on the riverfront and listen to the free music and eat your muffaletta. Whew, if that's not heaven, I don't know what is. Central Grocery is a local landmark in the French Quarter. Take a moment and take it all in. The place is jam-packed floor to ceiling with all kinds of delicacies. Central Grocery has been operated by the Tusa family for nearly a century, and it's the place to go in New Orleans to find ethnic foods. With the passion for food comes a passion for the city. In the classic play, A Streetcar Named Desire, playwright Tennessee Williams wrote about rainy afternoons in New Orleans where a little piece of eternity dropped into your hands. You can't take a streetcar named Desire, but you can hop on the St. Charles line and ride the city's best streetcar. This national landmark is the oldest continually operated streetcar line in the world. It was introduced to North America at the World's Fair in New Orleans in 1884. For the best streetcar destination, take the St. Charles line to the Garden District and stop off at the Columns Hotel. The massive columns of this mansion frame a gallery made for sipping a cool cocktail. From the columns, we'll continue uptown into the heart of the Garden District for a view of the most expansive homes and gardens in the city. Here, the world changes from the Vieux Carré, or Old World Square of the Quarter, into mansion-lined streets. Originally a sugarcane plantation, the Garden District was developed after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 by Northerners who came to town with their own vision for an upscale American neighborhood. The Garden District's mansions are some of the best examples of 19th century American architecture, but it's the gardens that give this neighborhood its name. The homes remain private residences, but there are a few ways to experience life in the Garden District. The Sully Mansion is one of the area's most unique bed and breakfasts. Like the Columns Hotel, it was designed by the 19th century architect Thomas Sully. It has all the features associated with this master builder of the South. A dramatic entry reception hall with a grand staircase, stained glass, deep rooms, rich detail, and a porch that makes you want to sit and watch the world go by. If you don't stay at the Sully House, there's another way to see the homes from the inside out. Take a tour of the Women's Opera Guild House. Built in the 1850s and renovated in the 1880s, the house is a combination of New Orleans Queen Anne and Greek Revival styles. The stained glass is vintage Tiffany. The furnishings, also a combination of styles, reveal the former owner's taste and European travels. In the heydays of the Garden District, owners built homes with a desire to entertain in grand fashion, and many of the present owners continue that tradition. Bordering the Mansion Line Garden District is Magazine Street, named for the French tobacco shops called Magazine that did business here. Today, Magazine Street is the place to go for the best bargain shopping. A series of quaint and quirky stores sell everything from antiques, hip clothes and designer jewelry to groceries. Shop after shop line the six mile strip that follows the curves of the Mississippi River, making the hunt for the best piece at the best price a day long deal. The city has a long history of being a home to America's most eminent Southern writers, including Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote and William Faulkner. This legacy continues in the Garden District, the present home of New Orleans' most celebrated living writer, Anne Rice. 
in a series of books that began with Interview with the Vampire, Anne Rice's enticing settings combined with the lure of the vampire have created the best tourism phenomenon. Tours featuring the locations so vividly described in her books. According to Anne Rice tour guide Bill Murphy, her fascination for the city began at an early age. Anne grew up in the city of New Orleans. She lived here until she was 16 years old. And when you grow up in the city of New Orleans because it has so much history, and because it has so many historical locations, and because she had a father who was interested in that, I think a lot of that seeped into her personality. Although Anne Rice's locations are historical, the vampire myth is something new. New Orleans had a, had a history of werewolves, we had weir bears, weir vultures, uh, weir cougars, zombies, voodoo people, but it's really strange because we didn't begin to develop a tradition of vampires until Anne Rice wrote Interview with the Vampire. Anne Rice settings in the French Quarter include Madame John's legacy, the old Creole residence that survived the fires of the late 1700s, Café du Mont, Pirate's Alley, the Omni New Orleans Hotel, Gallier House, and the shops along Royal Street. In the Garden District, the Elizabeth Orphanage, dating back to 1865, was fully restored by Anne Rice. Many devoted fans make the pilgrimage to Anne Rice's home, considered to be a perfect New Orleans take on Greek Revival architecture. No tours are allowed to go beyond the cast iron gates, but we'll show you what you won't be able to see on your own. The gardens and grounds are settings described in her novels. Inside, the living room is a blend of taste and comfort. It houses a world-class doll collection. Other items reflect the interests of the owners. Her library only hints at the amount of research that goes into an Anne Rice novel. And for the true fan, the Garden District Bookstore is the place to find signed first editions of her books. Another tourism phenomenon is the gator population. Just about every novelty store carries some sort of alligator item, but you need to travel outside the city to find the real thing. Alligators are ideal inhabitants of the freshwater marshes and swamps where they find an abundance of everything they need. Waterways, mud for cover, dense vegetation for nesting, and plenty of fish and small mammals to eat. And September is alligator hunting season, although it's not open season. Alligator hunting is heavily regulated. While you can expect to see a gator or two, what you might not expect to find is the coolest critter, the white alligator. They're lucky to call the Audubon Zoo home because the lack of camouflage in a brown-green marsh would have made survival in the wild unlikely. Well, they're not really albinos. Uh, what we have are called leucistic alligators, and these are an incomplete form of albinism. Leucism is um, a much more rare genetic anomaly that occurs. And the biggest difference is that true albinos are a complete lack of pigmentation, leaving them with pink eyes. And al the leucistic alligators are actually a prettier white, and they have a brilliant blue eye. And some of them have freckles, kind of big moles and things, usually concentrated on the head. Unless the zoo can breed more, it may be the end of the line for this most popular attraction. The chances are pretty slim. And it takes them about seven or eight years to become sexually mature, so this is kind of a slow process. They're only 15 years old at this point. Other critters that you might not expect to find in the swamplands outside New Orleans are cougars and black bears, though cougars are rare and hard to spot. An estimated three to 400 black bears live in Louisiana, a subspecies of the American black bear. The native bear is smaller with a lighter coat and less body fat, since this bear doesn't go into hibernation. And the best pest isn't even a native. Imported from South America, it thrives on eating everything from coastal trees to swamp vegetation. This ravenous rodent, the nutria, is a serious environmental threat everywhere except the zoo, where they keep the population in check. We were actually using a lot of those animals to feed them to our alligators, so they weren't going to waste. The state of Louisiana has issued a bounty of $4 per tail on this best pest. Our search for the best of the Big Easy leads to the best of the streets. In the quarter, on any given day or night, the spirit of New Orleans bubbles up. From lone musicians to impromptu brass bands, 
generations have grown up with the rhythm of the streets. As for the Big Easy's best kept secret, we discovered that here, the best things in life are still free. The best kept secret can be found along Decatur Street in the French Quarter at a place you're likely to walk right by unless you know it's there. Every Saturday afternoon, the Louisiana Music Factory hosts a showcase for homegrown talent and their newest releases. The music is live, the beer is cold. It's a great local scene, and it's totally free, except for the CDs you'll want to buy. On the day we stopped by, a band called The Hot Club of New Orleans debuted their classic jazz meets New Orleans swing CD. The store has a history of supporting local artists and an extensive collection of new and obscure recordings. New Orleans has two seasons, BC and DC, before Carnival and during Carnival. French for Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras is the insane finale to the wild Carnival season that begins on the 12th night of Epiphany, January 6th, and ends exactly 46 days before Easter. At Blaine Kern's Mardi Gras world, the Big Easy's most famous float maker prepares for the party all year long. Now what happens immediately following Mardi Gras each year, we put everything away, all the ladders, the buckets, the light bulbs, and we start gearing up for next year's celebration. We produce about uh, 500 floats each year. Mardi Gras world is open to the public. Daily tours offer an insider look at the most famous floats and the fascinating art of float making. In addition to new floats, old floats are refurbished each year to reflect the theme of Carnival. Others are so elaborate that they're used year after year. Uh, the float that we have behind me is a five section long float. It's 240 feet long. This one float cost about $800,000 to build. It's pulled by you know, a huge farm tractor and uh, it's pretty amazing to see it come down the street. And everybody as they're watching it come down the street, they're screaming, throw me something, mister. But unlike other floats, it takes forever to go by. I mean, it's right there in front of you for like, it seems like forever. And uh, to see people's eyes from out of town, they just like get real wide because they can't get over. I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. It's almost a football field, so it's pretty amazing. Mardi Gras could be the world's best party. It's also called the biggest free show on earth. No admission is charged to bystanders, but it's not exactly free. Behind the 1,200 floats and 588 marching bands are 60 parading crews, private organizations with names like Bacchus, Orpheus, and Demian, Zulu, and Rex, who put on the party. Crew is spelled K-R-E-W-E, -E, crew. The crews basically are made up of members of an organization. The organization actually formed these crews, you say, to participate in Mardi Gras parades and other activities. Most crews raise money in order to have their activities during Mardi Gras, so they may have different functions throughout the year. Bacchus is right at two and a half million dollars, and people just don't understand what it takes to put that type of production together. Uh, you know, we've had people from all over the world, Hollywood, that put on these great shows, and many of them say after they leave and see Bacchus or Rex or Orpheus or Endymion, they've never seen anything like this in their life. The finale begins on Saturday when Endymion parades with the impressive multi-level, multi-connected floats. The Bacchus crew parades on Sunday. The Monday before Mardi Gras, called Lundi Gras, is the parade of the colorful Orpheus crew. Many of the larger crews have kings and queens. Where the Bacchus king is a celebrity, other crews elect their royalty. In our organization, we actually vote on the king. One of the most prominent uh, kings of Zulu was Louis Armstrong in 1949. But um, all other kings are great. Okay, all the kings of Zulu and all the kings of every crew is a great individual because once a king, you're always a king. Just listening to a king talk the way that he walks is, he's a king. 
The party begins to really peak on Lundy Gras when the kings of Zulu and Rex arrive Riverside. The frenzy continues to build on Mardi Gras Day, Fat Tuesday, beginning with the Zulu Parade, followed by Rex. Rex is the oldest marching crew founded in 1872. Seniority counts, and Rex is the king of carnival. During Mardi Gras, tons of beads are thrown from the floats to those who yell, throw me something, mister. But the most sought after Mardi Gras throw, the Zulu coconut, is actually a handout. It's illegal to toss these one-of-a-kind Mardi Gras keepsakes. An estimated 2.4 million people attend this world's best party that ends at the stroke of midnight on Fat Tuesday. That's when the cleaning crews take over. It's said the success of Carnival can be measured by the amount of trash it generates. Fat Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, finds many of the faithful and repentant in church for the official beginning of the season of Lent. has so many layers. There's a Mardi Gras layer, an architectural layer, a voodoo layer, there's a food layer, and an amazing music layer. Each layer is as rich as the next. So it's just this mixture of so many things that go into making New Orleans such a unique city. I mean, there's nowhere else in the world where, where people have this sort of attitude, this bohemian lifestyle that, that, that's so great. The best part of the Big Easy are the people, the tolerance of the people. Everybody's friendly. You go in a store and they say, say, darling, what do you want? You want to fall in love? This is perfect city. You want to eat? It's a perfect city. You want to drink? Welcome. You come here and you eat probably too much and you probably drink too much and you do everything too much. And that's romantic. I like that. And after you've experienced all the best the Big Easy has to offer, seek out the most romantic way to end the day. Head toward the river and cross the mighty Mississippi by ferry boat to Algiers Point. From the point, take a moment and watch the sun as it sets on one of the best cities in North America.